Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're just going to allow everyone to get into the meeting and then get started. Thanks for joining everyone. Just give us one more minute for everyone to get into the meeting and we'll get rolling. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly McDevitt, the president of IBI. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. We are pleased to bring you our webinar on a research project that we've just completed on long COVID and chronic conditions and their impact on productivity and disability. We are um, overjoyed to have Phil Lacey, uh, the health and productivity practice leader for MMA join us today for our Q&A and Carol Bonner, who is our lead researcher on this project. So I'm sure you all can um, empathize with the fact that over the last 36 plus months, we have all been dealing with the pandemic and the cost of COVID on our medical claims, our pharmacy claims, hospitalizations, et cetera. But what we've not been really able to concentrate on is the impact of COVID and a specifically long COVID on disability and productivity. And as you all know from the science that we saw during the pandemic, long COVID is um, a squirrely little rascal to both diagnose and to predict. Um, it comes with symptoms that are oftentimes not really um, trackable in a claim and providers seem to have a little bit of a hesitancy to identify a claim in some cases for long COVID. And so, and, and couple that with the fact that we didn't really have ICD-10 codes for COVID or long COVID until almost a year after their existence. And so for us to be able to track this impact in the disability world, in the leaves world, you know, has presented us with some challenges. But the 2021 data gave us a clearer picture of what we were seeing and Carol's research into more recent data um, on long COVID specifically and the comorbidity of chronic conditions with long COVID, we have a better, I think a better view on where we're going and what this is costing employers. We're gonna talk a bit about the challenges for employers around long COVID and disability and return to work. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Carol Bonner, our lead researcher on this project, and she's gonna take us through the data and then Phil and I are gonna have a conversation on what employers can do about it. So again, welcome everyone. Hello, everyone. I am excited to do this uh, webinar. I'm always excited about my research, but this one in particular has uh, hit close to home. While the research on long COVID is still emerging, there have been a, numerous findings to emerge um, from this endeavor. In fact, there are more findings than can be covered in this presentation. Uh, fortunately, IBI members can access the full report now, uh, while non-members will have access in a few months, and the slides from this webinar will be available to everyone following the webinar. We're going to talk about a little bit about background of, of the research, um, including the objectives and data sources. We're going to talk about findings in terms of the general workforce. Uh, we're going to talk about findings in terms of the disability claims, and of course, we'll bring that together, and then we'll have expert guidance for employers provided by Bill Lacey. Throughout the presentation, feel free to send any questions that you have through the Q&A. Uh, we'll set aside some time at the end to address, address them. So a little bit of background. Um, key findings from the literature. I conducted a study last year 
which analyzed the impact of the pandemic on employee abs absenteeism during the first two years of the outbreak. Um, Health-related absences attributed to the pandemic were 6.6 billion hours, uh, with a continuing upward trend in the third year. In addition, the pandemic is said to have caused a decrease of half a million people in the U.S. labor force. COVID-19 is not the only factor affecting the workforce. Chronic illnesses are prevalent with an estimated six in 10 adults having a chronic Ill illness. This accounts for a significant portion of the nation's annual healthcare costs, which is approximately $4.1 trillion. Long COVID has been recognized as a, a widespread disability and is affecting around 4 million working age adults, according to a CDC RAND study, which also found that workers who were absent from work due to COVID for a week or more were less likely to remain in the labor force one year later. Um, but aside from the literature, um, let me tell you true stories that illustrate the profound impact of COVID beyond the acute phase. Um, and how it has hit home for me. I learned just a few weeks ago that a very, very dear friend, my best friend of more than 30 years who battled uh, COVID-19 twice uh, was struggling with a persistent cough. She decided one day at work to cut her workday short and um, not too long after she stepped outside to go to her car into the fresh air, she began to gasp for breath. A coworker called 911 and she soon learned that she had multiple blood clots in her lungs. She spent many days in the hospital and now is battling a life-threatening illness. Um, she has since been out on disability with an uncertain end. And another close family friend who recovered from severe COVID, uh, he was hospitalized, um, later developed a Parkinson's-like illness, forcing him to go on disability just this week. In both cases, they say the doctors mentioned a COVID connection in passing, but they did not make the, the definitive diagnostic connection to long COVID. So this demonstrates the urgent need to explore the long-term effects. And um, all this highlights the need for employers to address these issues and support their employees. So let's talk about just simply what um, we're going to address in this webinar. We're going to talk about how many people are affected, who is at risk for long COVID, um, how work absenteeism has been affected, um, who is at a higher risk for work disability. And then we will talk about how many people filed short-term disability, uh, what are the associated costs, how long did that last, how many converted to long-term disability, how many returned to work, and differences across industries and geographic regions. So let's uh, talk about the data sources. In terms of those first four um, questions, we're gonna look at the National Health Interview Survey, which is a government data set. It's a nationwide survey conducted by the CDC that covers a broad range of health topics. Our subsample, included data from 2022, and it is publicly available. And then the rest of the questions will be addressed by IBI disability claims data, which contains information on various chronic conditions, including COVID-19, long COVID, cancer, cardiovascular uh, disease, diabetes, obesity, mental health, and MSK, musculoskeletal problems. In this presentation, we sometimes summarize the chronic conditions collectively. However, we break it down in great detail 
in the uh, in the report. So let's jump in. Uh, and this, we begin with the general workforce. Within this context, the COVID-19 virus's um, volatility becomes clear because it exhibits a wide range of symptoms severity, as we all know, um, including the spectrum from no symptoms to severe symptoms. According to the analysis of NHIS data, of those who tested positive or were diagnosed with COVID-19, 9.2% remained symptom-free. The vast majority, 76.3%, experienced mild to moderate symptoms, and notably 145 experienced severe symptoms. It's important to um, to note that those who reported having COVID in this studies and other studies is lower than the estimates based on, based on studies that measure prevalence of antibodies in the bloodstream. So it does make it difficult. According to new research, many COVID-19 survivors experience symptoms and functional limitations month after months after infection. Long COVID refers to lingering health effects post COVID. And there, there's, um, as Kelly alluded to, it's difficult um, um, because there isn't a clear understanding of what long COVID is. Um, my friend who has the blood clot says, I don't, said, I don't have long COVID, but I think it's connected to COVID. Well, that is what long COVID is. Long-term effects of COVID-19 uh, can, can vary from person to person, can affect various parts of the body, including brain, hearts, joints, and lungs. Long COVID patients may experience a variety of symptoms, uh, ongoing research at Recover Research Initiative suggests that they have documented 200 symptoms and they're still counting. These symptoms may appear and disappear over time. They can last a few weeks, a few months, longer. Uh, they include fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive impairment, and musculoskeletal pain. There can be a deterioration of physical or mental condition after exertion, and this is very common. It's referred to as post-exertional malaise. Any of these effects can have a significant impact on the ability to work, either by making it difficult or limiting it altogether. Another study out of Yale, um, that sought to map the genetic architecture of COVID-19, which sounds so complicated, um, but it, it, they're looking for biomarkers so that long COVID is, is easier to uh, diagnose. However, they, they're in the recruitment process for control groups, um, they had difficulty. Many people who indicated that they had completely recovered from COVID-19 expressed interest in participating. But as they interviewed them and examined them, uh, they found that some of them had not fully regained their optimal state of well-being. And the study goes on to say that many individuals reported discontinuing gym attendance, uh, experiencing discomfort during physical activity, which is the post-exertional malaise. And I think this observation suggests that long COVID may be under-identified and under-reported. So let, let's talk about prevalence. And just as prevalence of COVID-19 is uncertain, the prevalence of long COVID is even more uncertain. 17.8% of individuals who tested positive or were diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, are estimated to experience long COVID. Now looking at 
chronic conditions and the prevalence. We have the highest prevalence uh, being obesity at 33%, anxiety and depression, 25%, and then MSK, 14%. So this top line is chronic conditions, the prevalence alone. The bottom line is people who have long COVID and what chronic conditions are present. And again, it see, seems to be the same pattern. Obes obesity is 47%, anxiety, depression around 39%, MSK 23%, and chronic lung conditions, and this is asthma or uh, COPD is around 14%. So let's talk about the risk factors for long COVID in the general workforce. The baseline odds of experiencing long COVID is very low in absence of other factors. However, as uh, you can see symptom severity has a big influence. If you have severe symptoms, your odds of experiencing long COVID increase five to six times. Moderate symptoms, the odds increase more than two times. And chronic lung conditions, almost two times. Um, these others, they look low, in comparison, but they are significant. Anxiety and depression, you have 38% increased odds, obesity, 52% increased odds, and MSK, 49% increased odds. And you are at a higher risk for experiencing long COVID if you're female, 43% more likely. I think what is, uh, I don't think any of those are really a surprise. But uh, I think what is very important is those who experience cardiovascular conditions, cancer, diabetes, race and ethnicity, or income do not show significant associations with long COVID. All right, talking about productivity losses, the analysis, this was a a regression, no, this is the mean number of work days lost. Um, we saw that having long COVID alone, uh, an employee's average uh, number of missed work days is 10. However, as you add chronic conditions, it goes up. So cancer alone, you have 9.6 days, but cancer with long COVID, 18 days. So overall, the number of days missed with um, chronic condition and long COVID goes up twofold. So let's talk about disability, risk factors for disability. And this was uh, a model. If you look at stroke, you have four, more than four um, times increased odds of being disabled. And disability in this context is the inability or limited ability to work. Anxiety and depression, a big one. four times the odds of experiencing disability. MSK, almost three times the odds. And these others are very significant, uh, but that stroke and mental health, which is a big one, um, and we continue to see that in the data. This is a risk factor for disability. So let's look at disability claims. 
right? That was work disability, the employee reporting that um, they have a limited ability, but let's look at actual short-term disability and long-term disability claims. And this is from IBI's disability data, and it is 2021. It's important to, if, if you understand the um, ICD-10 codes, COVID um, is, we designated COVID, COVID to be less than 75 uh, calendar days lost. But long COVID, if you get, got over that 75 day mark, we designated it as long COVID. Yes, and, Kelly. And Carol, I just wanted to reiterate, when you think about the timing of this data, and, and I will say this about all of the data, even the data that Carol just spoke to that was not IBI data, we believe strongly that both COVID and especially long COVID are vastly underreported. When we looked at the disability claims that are coming in from 2022, this is continuing to be the case. We have providers who are especially in comorbid situations like Carol just reviewed, using old ICD-9 codes to try and report COVID and long COVID. They haven't even transitioned over to ICD-10. And remember in the back of your head, as we go through this data, the code for long COVID, ICD-10 code for long COVID only came out in October of 2021. And so this really only includes three months of data for on long COVID in the disability claims. And so, well, reported as such. We know that they were using other upper respiratory codes for long COVID, but we are looking at the actual COVID and long COVID ICD-10 codes in this data. So I'm sorry, go ahead, Carol. Just wanted to yes, yes. Uh, level set everyone for what we're looking at. Yes. And and to make that clear, this long COVID is the, the entire year's data, but it's any one of these codes that is over uh, 74 days. Also, when we talk about cardio and stroke, we're talking about angina, heart attack, and stroke. When we talk about uh, mental health, we're talking about anxiety and depression. And when we talk about respiratory, we're talking about chronic lower respiratory disease. All right, so here is a, a overview of short-term and long-term disability claims. There were approximately 195,000 COVID-related STD claims, um, but there is a, a relatively lower cost there, averaging about 2.5 thousand per close claim, right? These claims have a, a relatively short duration, 22 lost calendar days. And notably, none of these are reported as long-term disability, it's COVID-19. But as they go to long COVID, we see long-term disability. The so long COVID had fewer claims, but higher costs, 5.3 thousand, and higher, much, much higher lost calendar days. We had 5,427 LTD claims uh, with payments of a little over 9,000 and 35% of those returning to work in less than two years. And chronic disease uh, conditions we have in this, in this slide, all of them lumped together. They are detailed in the report. So there are many, many more. Uh, but the average payment for STD is around 6,000 per close claim. And the average length is uh, 81 lost calendar days. Again, a lot of LTD claims and much, much, much higher cost, 20, around $29,000 per average per uh, closed claim for chronic conditions, 
with a 27% return to work within two years. And let's look at the outcome. Short-term disability claims related to COVID reveal a relatively low, 2% um, reaching maximum duration. Uh, however, long COVID presents a starkly different scenario with 33% of closed SCD claims extending to the maximum duration. Chronic conditions fall somewhere in between around 25% reaching the maximum duration. Conversion from short-term to long-term disability, we have a distinct pattern. COVID shows a low 16%. Long COVID, much, much higher, more than twice. It is 34%. And then chronic conditions, 10%. Returning to work, the primary goal of any disability claim is to successfully return to work. Uh, long COVID and chronic conditions exhibit very varying levels of success. We have long COVID at 33 and chronic conditions at 27, as we discussed on the prior slide. So these findings hi highlight the unique challenges posed by each health condition um, in the realm of disability claims and the need for tailored and comprehensive approaches to support individuals throughout various phases of their health journey, uh, from short-term disability to potentially long-term accommodations and ultimately successfully reintegrating into the workforce. So let's look at uh, these key metrics across industries. Uh, the, the data reveals significant differences in short-term disability claims across various industries, including claims for COVID, long COVID, and chronic conditions. Uh, these uh, differences are observed in a number of claims, payments per closed claim, and duration, right? Prevalence, you see manufacturing stands out with the highest number. Um, long COVID claims are highest for manufacturing and COVID-19 highest for manufacturing. The services industry is also high. Uh, finance and insurance and real estate have a notable number, um, but you see agriculture is low and it's low across the board and uh, that's agricultural and mining. And public administration is relatively low. When we look across geographic regions, we also see differences, notably Connecticut from the Northeast uh, leads with an average of 13.3 thousand dollars per closed claim, followed closely by Rhode Island, 12.8, Vermont at 12.4. Uh, in the West, California tops the list with 12.1 per closed claim. This is an average, while New Mexico follows at 10.6. Midwest has Michigan with an average payment of 10.6 and Illinois at 10.1. Other noteworthy states are uh, Montana in the Midwest. I'm sorry. I just skipped all over Colorado, um, Oregon with high, high average payments respectively. In, in South, Maryland stands out, average payment 9.8. Okay. Here we have a recap, and I tried to bring it all together. This is the NHIS data, and it, it uh, pertains to the general workforce. 
And this is disability claims. And if you will look, you will see that the high numbers uh, in terms of uh, prevalence, comorbidity with long COVID, work disability, and work disability with long COVID, they are high for obesity, for anxiety and depression, and for MSK. When you look at disability claims, you've got the same pattern. But when you talk about the number of missed work days uh, with chronic conditions, that's high for these conditions, long COVID, cancer, cardio, diabetes, and comorbid is high. And I'm wondering if um, these reasons are because these people have or disabilities. All right, and lost calendar days, cancer is high. Uh, this is for disability. All of the cancer numbers are high for disability. Doesn't surprise anyone. Um, heart is high for disability payments and lost calendar days. And again, we said anxiety and depression, and MSK. Anxiety and depression seems to be a thorn um, across the board. MSK has always been a thorn across the board. And again, this is a lot of data, but it is, is available in detail in the report. And so now I hand it over to Kelly. Hi there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Carol. Um, I've been answering a lot of Q&A questions oh, as good. we go, so I think we're up to speed in the Q&A box. Um, let me just check it really quickly before we get started anything. Uh, someone just asked if there's any reporting available for vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. There is not in the IBI data. We just get claims data from the carriers, so they don't provide any data on who is vaccinated, who isn't. But Carol, was that available in any of the data sets that you used? Um, no, it was not. It was okay. not available in NHIS. Yeah. And 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 oftentimes the data sets that we use collect, you know, through survey data, a whole lot of things, but not everything. And so it's hard for us to slice and dice the data in that way. It um, just, just FYI, it might be available for the household pulse survey data, mm -hmm. if they can reference that. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and then another question came on industry, Carol. Um, in the report, you have the cuts by industry for yes. COVID. Yeah. So that'll be in the full report. Yes. For, the for each API. condition. For each, each it's, it's a lot of detail. It's a lot of detail, order. yes, but at least it breaks down by industry. Yes. I think folks are uh, a lot of folks who handle clients that are in the healthcare industry, mm -hmm. who we know had higher uh, prevalence of COVID and probably long COVID as well, might be interested in the healthcare industry results. So that's in the report for IBI members. And again, those reports are embargoed for our membership for a period of time, a few months, and then will be available to the public on our website. And also got questions on what do you get uh, after attending this webinar? You do get the um, webinar itself, the recording, and then the deck and reports, again, are available to IBI members. Um, and then the last question was the source of the IBI data. Um, so our database is almost all of the large carriers in the space. We have about 3 million SDD claims every year, and that comes directly from the carriers. So we have LTD, STD, FML, and workers' comp data in its entirety. But for this particular report, we looked at STD and LTD data. Okay. So Phil Lacey, uh, the health and productivity practice leader for MMA, has been a past board chair here for many years at IBI and is considered one of the SMEs in the industry. So we thought it would be really interesting to get Phil's point of view because um, obviously he sits down with clients every day 
and talks through these issues and really want to concentrate on strategies that employers are either taking on now or giving some advice that they can take on in the future. Phil, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Yeah. So uh, let's talk first about strategies and interventions that you've seen to be effective in really kind of easing that return to work strategy for both COVID and long COVID. Um, Most employers after this kind of three year pandemic period didn't really know how to deal with return to work and especially depending on their industry, right? Because in some situations where people are working face to face, we have different problems with infection, with, you know, uh, obvious immediate needs. And then other industries where we've got a high hybrid workforce or full work at home remote force, you've got a different set of accommodations that might need to be made or maybe none to be made. So really talk to us about what employers are thinking about in their particular industries about return to work on these long COVID cases. Yeah, I think it's a it's a struggle even before the pandemic hit when it comes to return to work because of ADA. You know, I think employers have struggled for many years with trying to understand what they have to do within the context of of the regs under ADA. Uh, and then COVID just exacerbated that. So, you know, if you've got a workforce that is primarily a uh, a, a white collar workforce, an office based workforce, where when COVID hit, people could work from home. Uh, the dynamics of of having them return to work might be a little bit easier if they've got long COVID, for example, uh, where many of them have brain fog, for example. So if if they're very clear in the morning and their brain fog tends to impact them more in the afternoon, there's more flexibility in working with that person on maybe they can come back to work and work mornings for a while uh, and they can work from home. They don't have to travel back to the office. Whereas if you have somebody in a manufacturing facility who's got to actually be on on site, that becomes a little more problematic. And now you've got to look at their, their functional limitations and what they can and can't do. And how long is that going to last? And I, I think that's the other problem with long code. We don't know. We don't have really any clue how long it's going to last. Some people are recovering from it. Uh, a lot of people are still, still have it and have varying degrees of it. They may get better for a period of time and then get worse again. So uh, under ADA, of course, that it says, you know, you, you have to provide a reasonable accommodation, but if there is no end game as to when they're going to be able to do the essential functions of the job, then then maybe you don't have, there's nothing you can accommodate, right? So I think that becomes more problematic for, for those kinds of employees. Yeah, and let's talk about that. So when there's much unknown, which there is surrounding long COVID, and honestly, you know, still not really having a great clinical handle on what the treatment is for long COVID, depending on the symptoms, where does that leave an employer when they have to make a choice to backfill a job or to eliminate a job or to make an accommodation? And, you know, hopefully the person gets to a state where they can come back to work. How do they make those hard decisions? It is hard. And, and you know, I think the, the leave is an accommodation where you're just going to continue to provide leave because they can't come back at all right now. That to me is the most difficult one because they can't come back they can't do anything uh, or there's no way for you to accommodate them coming back in some kind of a partial or light duty role. And so you have to give them leave as an accommodation. And, and so how long is is long enough before you can say, I, I got to find somebody else, right? Uh, I know the Seventh Circuit Court has had two cases that have ruled in their mind, ADA is not was never intended to be a leave law and anything more than two weeks, they don't believe is should be something that you have to reasonably accept. Uh, is leaving an accommodation, but I wouldn't go by that because if you're in the Ninth Circuit out on the West Coast, they're going to look at that very differently. So, uh, but then there's people that have the ability to come back, maybe in a limited capacity, or you maybe they've got a lift, lifting restriction if they've got fibromyalgia or they've got some kind of chronic joint pain because of their long COVID. Uh, maybe you can alter their role or do something, and those people you can maybe gradually get back into the workforce full time. So, yeah, I think it's the one with with leaves an accommodation for an extended period of time are the ones that are more difficult to and more challenging to manage. Yeah. Yeah. I think where it becomes um, sometimes an even bigger challenge is if you've got a large national employer that has a disparate workforce that do very different functions, they may have, you know, a banking center, 
Yes, they have their banks that are open to the public. They have their call centers. They have their financial planning people. And so they have all of these different um, physical work locations and jobs. And yet they have to try and ap apply an equitable policy to everyone to return to them to work when really their workforce is very diverse. And so it's it's super hard to make it equitable for all and still be able to follow the rules. And then, you know, on top of that, I think the lack of guidance on this particular issue on long COVID in and of itself, both in the medical community and then the policy and legislation leaves us employers to try and set up a process. Uh, and I know some employers have a group that meets on these and, and these guidelines constantly trying to figure out how to continue to be flexible and keep their people at work um, or make sure that they're protecting the business. And so there's so much up in the air still on this and we're already so far into it. It's, it's I think, difficult for employers to manage and, and to manage well going forward. Um, I'm gonna move on to chronic conditions. Um, you know, we this is not new. I think that COVID and long COVID just exacerbated an existing problem with chronic conditions. Those are the conditions that typically we see in the STD and LTD population that cause long um, periods away from work. But are there any specific chronic conditions that present a unique challenge when coupled with long COVID that employers struggle to make, uh, you know, to manage these types of disability claims? Yeah, I, I think the, the the ones that more are more symptom based. Uh, so your chronic fatigue syndrome, your fibromyalgia, people with joint pain, um, and those have always been, even before COVID, those were the ones that disability carriers have the most difficulty in, in managing because they're symptom-based. Uh, mental illness, uh, chronic or uh, anxiety and depression, again, very much a symptom-based uh, diagnosis where it's hard for a disability claim professional to get out of a physician they have these symptoms, but what's the severity level of, of those symptoms that now put them at a point they can no longer work? And that's why a lot of the disability carriers years ago put in uh, subjective symptom limitations into their LTD contracts, for example, specifically for fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, because there just wasn't a lot out there to prove if somebody has that, why can't they work? Some people can work with it and some people can't. So where do you get to the point that, that, that the symptoms are severe enough? Um, the Social Security Administration has finally put out a paper on primarily for physicians saying, look, if your patient has long COVID and they're going to be applying for Social Security disability, we just don't accept symptoms as the basis for giving somebody an award on, on disability. We need more. And so they, they actually lay out the kinds of information that they're looking for to help a physician and their patient uh, provide the Social Security Administration with the right information. That would go the same for the disability carriers, too. They need that same level of detail uh, so that they can ascertain the level of severity to make a, a good, valid disability determination. Yeah, that's a good point. So when we try to help employers and employees prepare for the situation that a claim is going to be filed, I think, you know, obviously consulting firms that are helping employers through these situations and specifically in the absence of like yourself in the absence uh, arena could provide a set of sort of guidelines for employees to file those claims and for employers to review those claims. Is there anything out, uh, out there like that yet? Um, some of the insurers have done a good job of creating and TPAs have done a good job of creating um, what we call the attending physician statement. Um, that for some of these subjective symptom type uh, conditions, they go into a lot more detail that allows a, a physician to give them more information. It kind of reminds the physician, you know, so they can't sleep. How many hours a night can't they sleep? Uh, what are their sleep patterns like? So that the physician can give them that, that level of detail to help them make a, a better dis claim decision. So yeah, they're, they're starting to, to look for ways that they can get or educate the physicians through forms and 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 the like uh, to get the get better information up up front. Yeah, and and you know, thinking about the industries that we work with here, we work you know we work with clients that are small group, mid market, very large national accounts to the super jumbo national accounts. Everybody has different challenges to work with in those environments, um, and thinking about 
how they're, they work with their vendors to provide support for these plans and programs that they already have in place under STD and LTD, even FML. Uh, it, they have very different levels of administration support, right? So I think that where we can find public resources and guidance from those like yourself, Phil, to help employers work through this a little bit better without you know the lack of government guidance, it, those are always good things. And so I encourage employers to work with your consulting firms, your brokers, your uh, health plans even, for this type of support, they may already have something out there for you, a structure that you can follow when you're reviewing these claims. Um, one of our um, Q&A folks came in and said, we have the center of excellence around the country for post-COVID. I'm not sure if that was a question or that was a statement that we have centers of excellence for post-COVID around the country. So uh, anybody have a comment on that, Carol or Phil? I'm not sure about centers of excellence in, in terms of within a within a particular vendor. Um, there are there are some uh, insurers, for example, uh, one that does both stop loss and disability. And what they're finding is in their stop loss book, they're seeing a lot of long COVID starting to creep in as as very large stop loss claims, right? And so as a result, they're having their disability operation having more contact directly with the stop loss and the health care side of the house to identify these earlier on so if they can find ways to get that that employee uh, better treatment better outcomes that maybe they can save some some money on the stop loss side uh, and get that person back to work sooner I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration um, going forward between the employee their their disability claims administrator their health their health care provider and the, and then the uh, the health care system itself. Uh, yeah. if, if everybody's yeah, talking, there's a better way to get them what they need quicker. Yeah, agree. Uh, um, and and the other problem I think that we're up against here is the support, or I should say lack of support out there for the provider community around this, right? So, you know, doctors were thrust into this pandemic at the same rate that it, all the rest of us were. You know, uh, the people I talk to and that we serve are mostly benefit professionals at employers. They are not infectious disease specialists. They are, um, you know, HR specialists at best. And so while they had to become specialized in the disease of COVID-19 and long COVID and continue to do so, they never really had any specific training around that. And I think the same applies to physicians out there while they were trained, obviously, in infectious diseases professionally. It's these other halo things that we have to deal with during this pandemic, like STD claims, FML claims, LTD claims, um, that no one really went out and trained providers to say, okay, Here's how you should be doing it. And then you layer in all the complexities that both carriers and the system add to this complicated topic. And I think providers, someone mentioned this in the Q&A earlier, they're a little hesitant to code claims as long COVID, right? Yeah. Because certain carriers have you know, pre-certification rules in place or step therapy kind of rules in place and there's more hoops to jump through, right? Yes. And so, and, you know, not for nothing, but if you're diagnosing someone who is already a complicated case with comorbid conditions and then you layer a long COVID diagnosis on top of that, which is prevalent, which, which one is the key diagnosis that you're treating on that day at that time could change. And so those claims become very murky and we have a real problem looking at the data in retrospect, right? Yeah. So Phil, when you're sitting down and talking to employers about how to handle the strategy around this, is there anything, is there any type of guidance that you can give to them, not just about return to work, but about looking at their data? Because everyone is interested in seeing how this is affecting their company. But is there any guidance you can give them around looking at their data to look at these claims in a you know kind of more clear way? Yeah, that's that's a great question because we we tend to look at our data in silos. We've been looking at our data in silos for years. You know, if you're you look at your healthcare data and your pharmacy data in a silo, you may look at your disability data separately, completely separate from from that. Um, but when you take people that have chronic conditions 
Uh, and we've done studies on this in, in uh, display claim audits where we've we've looked at the number of medications a person on a short-term disability claim is on. And they may be on eight or 10 medications uh, because of chronic conditions that they have. And then you look at, they're only making 60% of their free disability income. How are they going to pay for these the, the co-pays and the deductibles on these medications, let alone the, the office visits to the various specialists they've got to go see when they're now only making 60% of their income? And so we see a deterioration in compliance of their of their medications and, and their treatment plans. And so I think it's important for employers to, to maybe look at their data across, across these silos to have a better understanding of the strategies they put in place, how they design their benefit programs, and what the impact might be when you actually integrate them together. Right. Right. And, you know, that gets to my point that I'm, for those of you who've been on our webinars before and know me, I'm all about living up to our name. We are the Integrated Benefits Institute. And for employers to really understand what's going on in the population, it's very difficult. We are a siloed industry at any given employer. You may have the guy that handles comp, then the guy that handles medical, then the guy that handles pharmacy, et cetera. And oftentimes those data, disparate data do not come together in any one good place for them to study a particular issue across the population and across all products and programs. And so to your point, Phil, you know, COVID when it first came out was a huge concern for health plan um, administrators from an employer's perspective, because we had no idea what the financial burden was gonna be. And those who handled the healthcare benefits didn't see a big bump because Regular COVID doesn't cost a lot of money for a mild case. We're looking at high cost claimants in their own little bubble and then the long COVID people in their own little bubble, but regular COVID flu-like symptoms or less on the medical side are pennies on the dollar compared to cancer, diabetes, heart disease, MSK, nothing. And so the healthcare guy isn't all that concerned about COVID. But when you pull in the broader view of those high cost claimants for long COVID, of those STD claims, of those FML absences, the cost of this disease are actually quite large. And so how can we how can we sit down with clients and talk about the bigger picture, the more holistic integrated picture and help them understand, you know, at the CFO level, the CHO, HRO level, what COVID might be costing them across their entire population through all products and programs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's where an integrated data strategy is is really the the best way to do that. Uh, where you can, uh, you know, I think you made the point uh, one time earlier around mental health that when you look at mental health costs uh, in terms of medical costs, they're they're really quite low. But when you factor in the lost time and the disability and the lost productivity costs, then they become more substantial. So you 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 really got to integrate your data to, to have a better, more holistic view of 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 cost and utilization. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, so let's let's talk about that particular piece because we know that we see from the data a ton of comorbidity with mental health and long COVID. Obviously, this disease has become you know a mystery to many, and because there's these varying symptoms that are getting kind of plunked into the long COVID bucket, it's very frustrating, stressful, uh, causes anxiety for people who are dealing with this. I know that some of the carriers out there in their return to work programs are embedding a mental health piece with that return to work. Um, are, are you seeing any best practices out there when people are out? And it doesn't even have to be long COVID, but when people are out for a specific disease and mental health is sort of bolted on as that comorbid condition, are you seeing any success in some of these return to work programs that work with the mental health aspect? Yeah, well, some of the display carriers will make referrals to their that employee's EAP, for example. Uh, they'll get them in touch with an EAP. Um, and many of them are now moving toward, instead of a typical case manager managing that mental health aspect of their uh, time away from work, they're bringing in behavioral health nurses, people that have uh, more of an understanding of, of chronic conditions around behavioral health, things like anxiety and depression or PTSD and, and how to go about working with that employee and to get the right information from their, from their physician uh, to be able to certify that that person can't work and for how long. So getting, getting the right expertise in there to, to meet with that employee is, is critical. And then 
uh, again, if that employer has other resources, uh, obviously there's now telehealth. Uh, during COVID, people couldn't get in to see a psychiatrist or psychologist if they needed it, right? And so access to care was a was a big problem. And and uh, now a lot of employers have got access through telehealth to get their employees at least some uh, some help online if they can if they want to go that route. Yeah. It- and I think that it's important, and, and actually we're seeing some new uh, vendors pop up in this space who are working with um, return to work mental health screenings, not just uh, connected to long COVID, but specifically when people are ready to return to work, even in a worker's comp situation where they've been out for an injury for a specific amount of time, maybe they are a bit hesitant to come back to the job that they were injured on. And so they're dealing with the anxiety and stress related specifically to return to work. Now we have the added complexity of some people who were remote and are now going back to the office and returning to a completely different environment that they left on their disability and these um, new vendors that are uh, out there, real, very new, are only dealing with that stress and anxiety piece of the return to work. And they're trained clinical professionals in the mental health space, right? They're not typical you know, return to work program people. They are mental health professionals. I'm going to be interested to see the ROI on that type of program and if it really does help to transition people back to a place where they're mentally as well as physically able to return to work. What do you think about some of those programs? Uh, I think they're excellent. And and especially the ones that focus on resilience. Right. You know, so um, because a lot of, a lot of, I think younger people in particular uh, find we're seeing more levels of stress and more levels of anxiety in that population in terms of filing claims, uh, STD claims in particular, um, getting those people some some kind of resilience coaching to help them stay at work and still deal with the problems that they have uh, keeps them at work, keeps your costs down, for example. But uh, yeah, I think some of these resi- resilience programs are going to be really forefront going forward. Yeah, agree. Well, we are, we have not, let me check our Q&A. Oh, here's a good question. It just came in. Are there any guidelines for long COVID for FMLA? Times an employer can be, ex- I'm sorry, an employee can be accepted for FML without the risk of their job, especially in Texas, who is an at-will employer state. Well, FMLA is is a federal law. And it just says that as long as the, the employee has is diagnosed with a serious health condition uh, and based on their eligibility, they have to work a year and 1,250 hours a year, they get 12 weeks of entitlement. And that can be on an intermittent basis or a continuous basis. So there's really, you know, as long as they're following the rules of FMLA, they have job protection, as long as that's a serious health condition and they're taking their absences accordingly. Is there any gray area in that FMLA where long COVID would not be considered a serious health issue? And our providers trying to work around that. No, in fact, the you know, the government has actually come out and and been pretty specific about under FMLA and ADA that COVID is considered a serious health condition. But uh, so the EOC has has actually come out and said we we consider COVID and long COVID to be a serious health condition. Great. Okay. Maria, I hope that answers your question. Okay, we have no more questions and I want to thank Carol obviously for her hard work on this research project. Again, those attending today we'll get a recording of this particular webinar. Our members will get the deck and the full report available on our website to them. And then after the embargo period, that will be available as well publicly. Thank you, Phil Lacey, for joining us today and giving us your expertise. And thank you all for joining us and providing a a great audience today with lots of questions. We appreciate you here at IBI and have a great holiday, everyone.